Deuteronomy chapter 21, please. Deuteronomy chapter 21, and we'll look at verse 1. Uh, the Lord laid this upon my heart today. I hope that this message will be life-saving to you when you go through this. This is pretty common in life. We are going to see what the Lord does when things go down, what he words it, a rough valley, a rough valley. It is inevitable in anybody's life. There is a rough valley, small, big, it doesn't matter, but there's something. It could even be something that you think is so petty as you're trying to get some sort of passing grade in an exam or in a school class. It could be where you have a tense relationship in the whole. Whatever it is, there's something rough that everybody goes through in life. Yeah. In Deuteronomy chapter 21 and verse 1, it says, If one be found slain in the land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee to possess it, lying in the field, and it be not known who has slain him, then thy elders and thy judges shall come forth, and they shall measure unto the cities which are round about him that is slain. And it shall be that the city which is next unto the slain man, even the elders of that city shall take an heifer, which hath not been wrought with, and which hath not drawn in the yoke. And the elders of that city shall bring down the heifer unto a rough valley, which is neither ear nor sown, and shall strike off the heifer's neck there in the valley. And the priests, the sons of Levi, shall come near. For them the Lord thy God hath chosen to minister unto him and to bless in the name of the Lord. And by thy word shall every controversy and every stroke be tried. And all the elders of that city that are next unto the slain man shall wash their hands over the heifer that is beheaded in the valley. And they shall answer and say, Our hands have not shed this blood, neither have our eyes seen it. Be merciful, O Lord, unto thy people Israel, whom thou hast redeemed, and lay not innocent blood unto thy people of Israel's charge. And the blood shall be forgiven them. So shalt thou put away the guilt of innocent blood from among you, which thou shalt do that which is right in the sight of the Lord. Uh, there are people who would use this passage to try to give some kind of prophetic uh, doom and gloom or upcoming apocalyptic statement that this has to do with the red heifer prophecy and the second coming of Christ. However, as Dr. Ruffin correctly noted, this is not about the red heifer. It is simply about a heifer. The red heifer is specifically mentioned in a separate passage, which is in the book of Numbers. But what this passage does have something to do with the rapture, which is very interesting, is that it gives the formula of what the Jews can do where they have crucified their Messiah in the first centuries. And if they followed this routine, God could have forgiven that nation and sounded the rapture, believe it or not. So it is a very interesting chapter. Basically, it covers a portion as follows. They see uh, somebody that is slain, and they don't know who slain him. And when that slain body is around the cities, then they have to measure the cities and find out uh, who's the closest to it. Once they find those that are closest to it, then they get the elders of the city involved. And then they make sure that they take out a worthy heifer. And this heifer, this heifer should not have anything that's been used up or uh, been used to draw in the yoke. So it's got to be fresh and new. Then they have to take that heifer down a rough valley. And in that rough valley, they are supposed to behead that heifer and blood should be shed. And then the elders of the city are supposed to wash their hands over that dead heifer and proclaim that the dead body that they found, not the red heifer, but the dead body that they originally found, that Hey, our hands are clean. We have not shed this blood over that uh, person who just died. So then that heifer is basically like that atonement and that substitute over that dead body. Then they erase the guilt and the sin away from their nation. As I look at this passage, it has a lot of interesting connections on what happens in a rough valley. 
I've explained to you the whole ordeal, but we will go verse by verse and examine each thing about what happens in a rough valley that might be very helpful to you. The Christian life, when we go through our down moments, it is described as a valley. And I would like to talk about how rough that valley is that could be helpful to you. The title of my message is Rough Valley, Get Ahead. Let's pray. Now, Father, as these people have prayed, and I'm going to pray myself, is that you'll fill within me the power of your spirit and the cleansing of your blood. You've never failed all this time, and you can use me again to preach for you. Will you please speak to these people, Father? Make this message help them in any rough moment they go through in life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Uh, my first point is what happened in the rough valley. What happened in the rough valley? If you look at verse one, if one be found slain in the land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee to possess it, lying in the field, and it be not known who hath slain him. What happened? You'll notice that in the rough valley, that they're about to take the heifer and behead it. Beforehand, there should be a dead body. And when there's a dead body, they don't know what happened. And a lot of times you have to realize that rough valleys, the reason why they're dead ahead of you is because of something died, of something that died in your life. And when something died in your life, let me tell you something. It's literally what happened. There is no answer. There is no explanation. And I want to tell you something. Rough valleys in your life are not your fault. Let me repeat again. There are rough valleys in your life that are not your fault. True sin has consequence. True, there could be some bad things that happen because of your sin. But let's be honest, not every rough valley we go through is because of our fault. It could be true that God sends a trial along the way or a test along the way. And it could be at other times the devil just attacking you because he just made him upset. We can give all kinds of explanations, but let's be honest. When we go through rough valleys in life, there is not an explanation sometimes, if not most of the times. You can figure it out. You can rack your brain. It's because of my sin. It's because God's trying to do something better out of my life. It's because I'm going through a trial. God's testing me or the devil. I made the devil mad at me about something today. You can rack your brain all you want, but we're just going to come down to the point. What happened? That's what you're going to end up in. What happened? And you will never figure it out. And God, notice in this passage, God does not satisfy the curiosity. He knows who murdered. He knows what happened to the dead body. I mean, couldn't the elders just ask, what happened here, Lord? We'll slay that murderer. But God says, no, I decide not to do that. Sometimes there are just things in life that you're not going to know. Right. And you're going to wonder what happened. Yeah. You have to understand that the flesh is always unpredictable and it is very unstable. When the flesh is so unpredictable and unstable, you're just going to have a rough moment even if you have a good day. Didn't you know that? Yeah. Didn't you know that you can even go through a rough valley when there is no rough valley? What do I mean by that? There's nothing really bad that happens in your life. Everything's good. There is no rough valley. But then your flesh is so unpredictable, it's so unstable that all of a sudden it could just feel bad if it was yeah. It's such a it's such an unpredictable, unstable thing. And you're just gonna have to admit that I'm gonna go through rough valleys, even if there are no rough valleys. Haven't you been like really soldier enough and man enough as a Christian and yeah, it's because it's your fault and it's because, you know, it's just your flesh and you just got to get over those feelings and you just got to march on for Jesus Christ. Well, that's fine and dandy. And I'm not uh, downing you for thinking like that. I think like that. I believe we should endure. I believe we should be soldier enough. I believe that we shouldn't be nitpicking and create our own bad moments. But let's just be honest. Flesh is so much the flesh. It is always the flesh. It is so weak. That it's just going to sporadically come out, even though, no matter how much you mentally prepare for Amen. it, Amen. rough valleys happen. Yeah. It's not just situations unexpectedly happen. 
that you're going to get rough valleys. It's even your flesh. Your flesh will just feel like it's going through a rough valley, even if you're having a good day, even if nothing bad happens. A lot of times we just don't know why. Uh, look at verse two. My second point is whereabouts in the rough valley? Whereabouts in the rough valley? The Bible says, then thy elders and thy judges shall come forth and they shall measure unto the cities which are round about him that is slain. So notice right here that once they see this dead body, they don't know what happened. They're supposed to take measurements, go through all the areas and places. They are to look at the whereabouts, the surrounding, and then make sure which cities are the ones that are closest to it, that this dead body affected. The Lord sees that when something dies in your life, and we live in a sin-cursed world and everything dies, that it can pollute the surroundings and the whereabouts. And that's why it's so important that when you don't know what happens in your life, you have to immediately start looking at the whereabouts. You have to look at your surroundings and see where that dead thing is. Affected. Something died inside you and you can't explain it, but you do know one thing, it's affecting certain whereabouts. It's affecting your heart. It's affecting how you see things. It's affecting how you're thinking things. It's even affecting your belief, what you believe in. And that's why your faith shakes up. So you need to see the whereabouts of where that dead thing is affecting. It's my eyes, so I gotta be careful with my, my eyes. It's my heart, I gotta be careful with my heart. Could be you wake up with a bad mood and there is no explanation for it, but you do know one thing, your mood is affected by that dead thing. And then once you know the specific whereabout that is affected, you stay on God. But a lot of times when something dies inside us, we're so busy trying to figure out why, 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 rather than looking at the whereabout, rather than looking in the area that the dead thing is affecting. If you were to look at the dead thing that is affecting your particular area, then you would go, okay, I got to watch out what I say because that dead thing's affecting my speech. So words are coming out that's discouraging the people around me. I got to be careful what I say. I got to guard my tongue. That dead thing is affecting the way you think. And then your brain is coming up with all kinds of imaginations that's causing you more panic, more fear, and just making life even rougher. And you gotta go, wait a minute, wait a minute. That dead thing's affecting my mind. I gotta get my mind off of that. You gotta find out the areas that's affecting. It could be your darkest fear as well. Sometimes rough valleys in your life what they do is they find those areas, those whereabouts. And that dead thing will find that whereabout and then go inside the unconscious or the subconscious mindset and find that darkest fear and get it out. What you need to do is you need to discover that too. If that dead thing discovers it and pulls it up for you without you knowing it, you'll never find that area to disinfect. You need to discover your darkest fear as well. You need to discover your loved ones that you're affecting with that dead thing. You're going to notice their reaction, their mood towards you. And you're going to realize that it's because of your attitude towards them. Why? Because that dead thing affected you where it now burdens your loved one. Imagine burning, burdening your family member, your friend, the people in this church. You got to stay on guard. You got to find out where that dead thing is affecting your certain particular area. Your blessings as well. You know that? You can have a nice Thanksgiving and it should be the day that you give thanks to the Lord and he blessed you with so many things, but then that dead thing is affecting you. And it's robbing you of your blessing. That dead thing's infecting. It's affecting, infecting your blessing. You gotta stop that. And cling on to your blessing and say, you're not going to rob me on my blessing. I got too many good things from the Lord. Your walk with God could be infected if you're not careful. Because of that dead thing 
that affected you, you skip Bible reading and prayer without knowing. That's good. That's why you have to look at your whereabouts. If there is a rough valley that you're going through, you need to realize something died. I don't know why. Stop trying to figure out why. I just got to realize that something died and it's affecting somebody in my life. It's affecting something in my life. It's affecting my mood, my heart, and I got to stop. Yeah. That's what you do know. If you know that, then stop that. You can stop those things. You may not find out the reason why and stop that. But you know what you can do? You can stop what you do know. Yeah. The areas that are currently being infected. You can still save your family. You can still save your children. You can still save your testimony. You can still save your joy. Amen. You might have lost some things in life, and that might be your reason to go to a rough valley, but you still didn't lose those things that are unaffected, that are still intact. You need to rescue and save those things. Don't let that dead thing take those things away too. Yeah. My third point, worthy heifer in the rough valley. Worthy heifer in the rough valley. Look at verse three. Notice, and it shall be that the city, which is next unto the slain man, even the elders of that city, shall take in heifer, which hath not been wrought with, and which hath not drawn in the yoke. Notice that their, substitu uh, their substitute their sacrifice that they should find to get rid of that dead issue is a heifer. And not just a heifer, it's a worthy heifer. Usually you'll find out in the Bible that when God wants a heifer, it's something that is unyoked. It has never toiled in or put in the labor, put on the yoke. God wants something fresh and new. Why? Because he wants the heifer to be untouched, not dabbled. When they start to put the yoke on that heifer, and that means somebody touched that heifer. Somebody put that heifer to work, and God wants it untouched. God wants it fresh, not dabbled with. In 1 Samuel chapter 6, verse 7, and Numbers chapter 19, verse 2, if you look at those two passages, it would show that the animal that does not put on the yoke is considered to be that worthy sacrifice that they're preparing. So it should be unyoked. It should be worthy, unblemished, fresh. Nobody dabbled with it. Now, let me tell you something. You have a Christian sacrifice and you don't have to have a literal heifer. But your worthy sacrifice in Romans chapter 12 is your daily life. And the Bible says uh, your body is a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. You are supposed to bring a worthy sacrifice to God That's good. that is not yoked by anything out there. But a lot of times there are some things that are yoked in your life. And when those things are your, yoked in your life, you can't give that up as a sacrifice to God. Remember in verse 4, they're supposed to take that sacrifice down a rough valley, right? When you go through a rough valley, you know what you're supposed to bring down with you? Your Christian sacrifice. That's good. Do you want to be saved in the rough valley? Do you want that dead thing not infect your life? You need a worthy sacrifice. You need a worthy heifer. And that is your own life. I know you don't like it, but the Bible says your body is a living sacrifice. God says the temple of God is holy. Which temple? Ye are. Nobody likes that, but that's the sacrifice. And that's the worthy sacrifice that can help you, that can substitute in your behalf when you go down the rough path. You might say, really, it always works. Complete surrender on the altar and a sacrifice for Jesus Christ always rescues you. It always saves your life. It takes care of a problem whenever you go down the rough path. To go down a rough valley without any sacrifice, that's why you're killing yourself. That's why you're bitter. That's why you're suffering. That's why you're hurting. And that's why the complaint arises. You cannot survive without sacrifice in a rough valley. You need to take that 
worthy sacrifice down with you in a rough valley. And you need to give it to God. But you know what the problem is nowadays? You thought that was the preaching. No, that wasn't the preaching part. <laughs> you know what the preaching part is? The preaching part is, yeah, you're giving your sacrifice. A lot of you are going through rough valleys. And you're giving that sacrifice to God. Oh, please pray for me, church. I'm just going through something that the Lord's dealing with me with and to help me endure. And God, give me grace. And I know you're doing all that kind of stuff. But you know what the problem is? It's not just any sacrifice God wants. It's not just any heifer God wants. Something that's unyoked. You know what your problem is? You're sacrificing for the Lord, but you got something still yoked in there. Oh, wow. There's some kind of fleshly imperfection that you're yoking in there. Remember, it's not your fault that the rough valley happened. The rough valley didn't happen because you were sinning or you did something wicked. No, no, no. But the thing is, a lot of times, and actually not a lot of times, every time, every time when you go through a rough valley, you do have to sacrifice something for the Lord. And when you sacrifice something for the Lord, or you go through the sacrifice for the Lord, it has to be pure. Yeah. It has to be worthy. It has to be untangled. But if you tangle it with work, you tangle it with busyness, you tangle it with your hopes and dreams, you tangle it with some uh, pride that you didn't know about, some selfishness you didn't know about, something of me, me, me in there. And God says, when he's seen that incense go up and that fire burn and that fire is purified, all that gunk out of there. And then the true parts are being known. And then God says, you see that right there? In the middle of your sacrifice, God is showing you something. And you see it. Or you're too blind to see it. During the middle of that sacrifice, in that rough valley, God's saying, you see that? What you need to let go. What you need to surrender. That's good. That was yoked up. You didn't know about it, but that was yoked up in your life, which is why this rough valley is being tough on you. That dead thing's affecting you. And then you go, you're right, God. And then God says, okay, are you going to really sacrifice that then? Yes, Lord. When you give that sacrifice, when you give that thing up into the sacrifice, it burns it up. And that helps you in the rough valley. But if you cling on to that thing and you won't sacrifice it, then it's going to be tough for you in the rough valley. In fact, it will be so tough, and you know this to be true if you went through uh, God's, uh, God's moment with you before. He will keep you in that rough valley until you finally sacrifice it worthily. Wow. You know I'm right. Amen. You know I'm right. You remember those moments you finally let go and say, okay, God, I will trust you. I'm, you're a great God, and I believe you love me. And you know you won't let me die. It's so hard for me. I try to love this, thing, but I will sacrifice it on the altar, Father, and give it up to you. And when you start doing that, and all of a sudden God takes you through that rough valley and gets you out of it. But you notice you're still in that rough valley when you won't let it go. When you won't sacrifice it. God says, sacrifice it. And you go, oh, God, I, I, I just can't. I can't. That's why you're still down. And rough valleys happen because of unworthy sacrifices. But when there's a worthy sacrifice, it gets you through that rough valley and out of there. That's good. Amen. There's something yoked up in your life. There's something yoked up in your sacrifice. You need to let it go. And let God burn it up. You need to give it to God. Amen. Why? He is worthy. Yeah. He deserves yeah. all, all of it. Yeah. Whatever your fleshly imperfection is, keep an eye out in your sacrifice this time, Christian. See what God's showing you. Oh, God, I'm suffering for you. I just have to go through it. And God said, ah, you see that? That's yoked up in there. You see that? A little bit of self is yoked up in there. A little bit of hypocrisy there. A little bit of laziness right there. A little bit of discouragement right there. A little bit of weakness right over there. A little bit of pride right over there. A little bit of God shows you. All right, God. Yeah. Okay, you can have it, Lord. I sacrifice it. And God says, finally, a worthy heaven. That's good. Fourth point, verse four. Verse four. 
And the elders of that city shall bring down the heifer unto a rough valley, which is neither year nor sown, and shall strike off the heifer's neck there in the valley. Notice that this worthy heifer must be wounded. Must be wounded. So that you can be free from that dead problem. We can think of several worthy heifers in our life that God has given. We can't talk about the world. They're blemished, right? Uh, we can't talk about lost people. They're the children of the devil. We can't talk about uh, fleshly stuff because it's tainted. If we're going to think about something that's worthy, the obvious answer is, number one, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the worthy sacrifice. He was the lamb that is slain from the foundation of the world, as they would say it. And Jesus Christ is that worthy heifer, worthy sacrifice. Now think about it. Had he never died for you on the cross, how would you do with your problem right now? How are you going to go through your rough valley right now if Jesus never died for you? But in that rough valley you're going through, you can use Jesus as your calling card. You can pray to him. You can claim his promise that all things work together for good. You have the hope that even if you're miserable now, you have a reward up there in heaven for eternity. That will pay back all the years of pain that you're going to even soon forget about the pain when you get to heaven. That's that hope. But what if Jesus never died? What if Jesus never got wounded on your behalf? You'd be in the rough valley. You know what you need to know? Somebody worthy has to suffer. Yeah. Has to be wounded in your place so that you can go through the rough valley. Wow, thank you, Lord. Now that's hard to understand. Don't take your salvation lightly when you go through the rough valley. Remember this, that Holy Spirit of God inside you can still be by your sin. Not only that, the Holy Spirit can even empathize. Jesus Christ can feel your infirmities. When you're going through a rough valley, Jesus is not, uh, you know, scot-free up in heaven. Jesus Christ goes through the pain with you. Thank you, Lord. That's the price of salvation. And Jesus knew it, but he said, I will suffer anyway so that I can help you go through that rough valley. Remember this, it's not you that got wounded. It's Jesus Christ that helps you through the rough valley. Not you, somebody else. If that's the case, then what about our brothers and sisters in Christ? Isn't the church of God, isn't the church of God something that is unblemished? And the church of God is bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ? That's another worthy thing. Yeah. And guess what? You won't like this, but it's very true. Swallow up your pride. And thank that brother and sister in Christ who went through sleepless nights praying for you, oh, yeah. caring about you, oh, yeah. bothering you with phone calls, trying to ask you, hey, uh, how are you doing? Or are you coming back to church? You know, that's the cuss word you don't want to hear. Thank, thank God. God for that. They're suffering for you. Yeah. You know what? Somebody worthy has to suffer, has to be wounded so that you can go through that road. Oh, I don't want to ask that church member or, you know, I don't want to go to pastor for counsel or help or something like that. No, no, you got to realize this. To go through a rough valley, somebody has to suffer, has to be wounded for you. So it's after. That's it. You know that? You know that? You didn't realize that, did you? People's good deeds are not just helping themselves. It's to help others. When people go through suffering, it's not just for themselves. It's because of others. What did the Bible say? I said in Corinthians 1, we go through suffering so that we can help other people with our suffering. Taking the teardrop from the brother and sister in Christ. Take their concern, you know. Take their opportunity to help you, to feed you when they bring food and join them for fellowship. When they open their doors and welcome you with open arms in church, don't reject that. No wonder you're going through a rough valley. You're not taking it in. You need to take it in. Why? Because in the past couple of years, 
of hell that we went through with the devil trying to throw down the church. What helped us is each other. Oh yeah. Yes, your friend needs to be wounded for you. I know you don't want to see your friend get bashed in the head, but that friend is bashing his or her head for you. Wow. If you think that's wild enough, what about your family? Especially if it's a saved brother, a saved husband, a saved wife, a saved son, a saved daughter, a saved mother, a saved father. Don't you think that, don't you dare think that when you go through suffering, it's by yourself. No, mom and dad did something to suffer to make your life better. Don't think that you suffering yourself. No, the children in your life is what heals you. It's what keeps you going. It's that husband, that wife you lean upon when you can't even tell anyone, not even the pastor. Because everyone tells the spouse, don't they? That's what the Lord said, to suffer for you. Oh, I don't want to see him or her wounded. Yeah, I know, but that's what family's for, to be wounded for. And when that husband, that wife, that mother, that father, that sibling of yours tries to get you into church, tries to get encouraged, he tries to get you to serve God, loves you enough to suffer and be wounded for you, helping you in the rough valley. I know what goes in our mind, you know. We have too much uh, independence and no, I can take care of myself and no, I feel bad that other people have to be wounded for me. Do you realize why they got wounded for you in your family? Why mom and dad got wounded for you kids? Why uh, the, the husband and wife got wounded for you? Why Jesus Christ got wounded for you? Why the pastor wounds himself for you? Why the pastor's wife wounds herself for you? Why the people in this church wound themselves for you? The teachers that don't get credit for their names in this church, that they wound themselves for you? It's so that they can see you happy. Not cry in a rough valley. Not get stressed out in a rough valley. Not be discouraged in a rough valley. They are happily, they are willing, even if you're not willing, they're willing to wound themselves so you can be happy. Why feel guilty about that? Why not just instead take it with gratitude? Yeah, amen. If you feel guilty, this is what you should do. Show them how happy you are. Tell them thank you. Tell them we don't have to do that. Thank you. All right, I'll get to church. All right, I'll be happy. All right, I'll try to do this. Just show them that. If you don't believe me, just try that out if you don't believe me. And see if that will not make the person's whole day. How many times has this pastor just made his day and a person said, thank you for the preaching. Makes my whole day. Oh, I just feel bad and he's just going through a lot. And no, 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 no. Why do you think I even take this job to begin with? Mm -hmm. To see you happy. Amen. Amen. To see you do something with your life that will bring glory to Jesus Christ. That's all I want. That's all your loved one wants. Why not just show them your smile inside, your gratefulness. And if you really feel that guilty, then with that happiness that builds up so much inside of you, pay it back to them. That's it. Hey, hey, you're wounding yourself a lot for me. Let me wound myself too for you. Did you notice that the past years of hell that we went through, how people were wounding themselves for each other in this church? And then we just had the joy of the Lord that was unspeakable and the fruits that were produced in a blowout or a revival meeting of so much pure energy and joy that can result from all of that. Why? Because of people wounding themselves for each other. That's it. Doing the pickup, paying extra money, helping out the speakers and encouraging each other. Bringing themselves here and then making sure everyone feels welcome in the fellowship. That's why we can enjoy a good time. It's because of people who wound themselves for each other. That's how you go through a rough time. You know how you can be happy? You notice the atmosphere is much better when we sing, when we fellowship and stuff like that. Because people are getting themselves out of the way. Wounding themselves in the process. 
to make sure that atmosphere becomes that. So I'm going to talk to that person. I'm going to fellowship with that person. I'm going to give them a new convert material. I'm going to invite them to the next service. I'm going to give them more details, answer their questions for, hey, that person's not saved. I'll lead that person to Christ. Or, that person needs to know a little bit more of the Bible. I'll mention some stuff to them. Or, hey, I can recommend a pastor. And then, or I can talk to pastor for you. And you notice that right there? When people wound themselves for each other, it creates such a happy atmosphere. And we enjoy it. Let's keep it up. Let's keep wounding ourselves for each other. Let me bleed for you. And you bleed for me. Why? Because we have a Christ who bled for all of us. Amen. Amen. And we're just one big happy family. <laughs> Let's make it even more so. Why? Wounds help. Wounds do help during rough valleys that are unexplainable. Fifth point, watchers in the rough valley. Watchers in the rough valley. If we look at verse 5, and the priests, the sons of Levi, shall come near, for them the Lord thy God hath chosen to minister unto him and to bless in the name of the Lord. And by their word shall every controversy and every stroke be tried. Notice that these priests, the ones God chose to minister to the people, they're watching for the city. They're like watchers, protectors, guardians for the city. The Bible talks about the ministers as also people who watch for your souls at the book of Hebrews. In order to go through rough valleys, watchers are more than necessary than ever before. You'll notice right here, it's because of them, shall every, their word and every controversy, every stroke be tried. Basically, you can see God's hand is on them. That God's blessing is on them. If I were you, I want to be near that watcher of the Lord so I can squeeze out any ounce of blessing that might surround that watcher of God. Elijah surrounded himself with Elijah. He didn't care. He was just a foot washer for Elijah. He knew that he had something. He knew he had something real. He wanted to get that blessing from that man of God. As a matter of fact, he even knew that, hey, I want a double portion of what you got. So I'm going to stick close to your side all the way. Elijah knew the blessing, the power, God's hand behind his man. If you see the spirit of God moving within a particular person, a man of God who's preaching his word and the fruits and the surrounding power is all over him. You know what I would do if I were you? I'd surround myself in that. Immerse myself in that. Grab a little portion of that. Because in a rough valley, I could use any blessing that I could get. Yeah. You know what I had to do? I had to grab any blessing from any man of God. out there. I'm not my own man of God. I had to seek, seek out other watchers in my life. Take in their good advice. Take even their rebuke. Take in anything good from them. And it made me what I am today. And I have a compilation of the blessings of God. Because all of them were taken by multitude of watchers in my life. I cannot get my own blessing, grab my own thing. No, I need it from those watchers. Stick around a little longer, huh? Maybe if you stick around that watcher long enough, in the middle of the teachings you faithfully attend, there's going to be a couple nuggets out there. Oh, yeah. That will incredibly bless your life. Oh, yeah. Just even fellowshipping around the watcher, maybe he might just accidentally slip up in something that might have been a blessing Amen. and a help in your life. Amen. Surround that person whenever uh, he's available to help you or even just talk to you because that minister won't be around forever. That minister will be busy with something else. Surround yourself in any opportunity with the watcher that God has put in your life. Grab any blessing that you can get. Grab any blessing you can get. But when you're, I guarantee you this, you criticize the watcher, you distance yourself from the watcher, you get away from church where the watcher is at, wherever the watcher is at, you make sure you separate yourself far from that person. How miserable are those people? How miserable would I be? Think about it. If I isolated myself from fellow watchers in my life, you think I'd be very happy? Why do you think we can enjoy a blowout? There are fellow watchers there. 
Why do I let other watchers speak to you? They can give you some blessing. Why? Because it's not just you. I need it. I need to hear that watcher. I can't just hearing myself all the time. Good job, Gino. You're doing a good job. Don't worry. Don't be sad. How good of an encourager are you to yourself? I need other watchers. People I know God's hand is on. God's blessing is on. And to hear their word of assurance and their atmosphere and just to be around them encourages me, strengthens me. My sixth point is washing in the rough valley. Washing in the rough valley. Go to verse six. And all the elders of that city that are next unto the slain man shall wash their hands over the heifer that is beheaded in the valley. You know, that's a sign that Pontius Pilate did when he washed his hand. I am innocent of the blood of this person. And what God wanted those elders to do is to do the same thing. Basically, I am innocent of the slain man. We have nothing to do with it. It's not our fault. And what they do is they, it's like as if it's picturing the washing that the problem is washed away off of them. It's not on them. Let me tell you something. What will help you immensely when you go through rough valleys and they are unexplainable and they cannot be attributed to your fault, to your sin, or you can't find an answer for it. God's trial on you, the devil's attack. You can't find an answer. You need to just realize it's not your fault. You need to realize, look, I have already meditated. I prayed about it. I surrendered it to the Lord. I've done everything I could. What more can I do now? If you repented under the blood, you're, you're forgiven. You're done. Yeah. Stop trying to figure out every other sin in the book. Wash, it, wash your hands and say, I'm clean. But that problem is there. Let it wash off. It'll wash off. You need to let the problem wash away. Every problem and rough valley in life takes time. And it sticks onto you like guilt. And then it sticks to you like glue. And then you're just at fault. You need to have peace. It's not me. I'm not at fault here. I've done all that I could. I need to let it go. Let the problem wash off. There's nothing you can do about it. You need to let the problem wash itself off. It's like a tie. A tie can, uh, once it comes in, onto that sandy side. The sandy side, you can make it bumpy and with bumps and then hills and then mounds and you can make it not flat, but that tide immediately, once it goes over that sand, it smooths it all out, all that rough parts and turns it smooth and flat. The rough valleys, those rough moments in your life, it takes a tide to wash it down. And then it's that tide after tide that those Rough things finally shrink and go away. But when you, when that tide comes, it takes waiting. There are days that a tide won't come. And you're waiting for that tide. That's what it is. You just need to let the tide come. The rough patch, just leave it alone in that sand, huh? Let the tide wash it off. It will wash away. It will guarantee because that tide's coming. And it has to flatten it. But you need to wait. You need to give it time. Think, rough things take healing. And healing takes time. Let the problem wash away. Let it go. You wash your hands. You're clean. Move on. Seventh point. Words in the rough valley. Words in the rough valley. Look at verse 7. And they shall answer and say, Our hands have not shed this blood. Neither have our eyes seen it. They are supposed to say the words while they're in that rough valley that my hands did not shed the blood. My eyes did not see the blood. What you need to understand is with certain parts of your body or your flesh, it is always unstable, unpredictable, and it always creates the problem. And you need to pronounce the words whenever the eyes are affected by the dead thing and it causes you a rough tension and worry and fear. You need to tell your eyes, my eyes 
have not seen it. My eyes will not look at it. My eyes are set on Jesus Christ. Amen. You need to say those words. Why? Because you're too dumb that you need to say the words. Amen. A lot of things are, in you. oh, I say in my heart and stuff like that. You need to firmly say it where you can know it clearly. You need to, if those hands are the problem that are being affected by the dead thing in your life, and those hands it always gets nervous and tense, so it has to do something. So then God forbid that you take a bottle. God forbid you use those hands to take in a puff of smoke. God forbid you use these hands for sin. Body parts only increase the depression. And you need to tell your hands. You need to tell those body parts. My hands will not touch sin. My hands will hold the word. So I can read it. You need to tell yourself that. When that heart is beating a thousand miles per hour and then all that feelings of anger, anger and fear and discouragement pump out. You need to tell that heart, my heart will not beat for fear. My heart will love the Lord. You need to say, you need to declare those words in the rough valley. Because certain body parts are being affected by that dead thing. And it's giving you a rough valley. So you need to tell yourself when you're driving to work, driving back to home. I will not fear. I will not panic. My eyes will not see sin. My mind will not think sin. My mouth will not say sin. My feet will not go to sin. You will go to, my feet will go to church. My eyes will be set on that book. My mind will be quoting memory verses. My hands will be passing out tracks. I need to do something with this body part that will not look upon that dead thing that's giving me a rough valley and a rough time. Instead, I will use that part of my body for the glory of God, something positive in my life, something that can give me joy. Amen. Amen. Uh, my hand's got to hold something. My hand's got to hold something. No, don't hold a cigarette. Hold a golf club. Go out golfing then. Amen. My hands will hold a golf club. Do something, man, with that body part that only increases your depression. Remember the second point, that dead thing, you have to discover where that dead thing is affecting certain whereabouts in your life. And you need to guard that whereabout. Once you find it, you need to give a statement. That area in my life will not surrender to the devil. Verse 8, verse 8. Wickedness in the rough valley. Look at verse 8. Be merciful, O Lord, unto thy people Israel, whom thou hast redeemed, and lay not innocent blood unto thy people of Israel's charge, and the blood shall be forgiven them. Now notice that God still sees wickedness in law. The people are not at fault. The people aren't the wicked ones. But God still sees wickedness in the ball. You know what will be I don't think to you? It may not be your wickedness that you're going through a rough valley. It could be somebody else's wickedness. Do you realize that? You can do everything right by the book, but... Why can't I enjoy a good family life? Why can't I enjoy a good church life? Why can't I enjoy a good work environment? Why can't I enjoy living in the city? Simple, because you're not the one wicked. Somebody else is wicked. That's why you're going through a rough valley. That's good. That's good. So what do you need to do? When you sacrifice, and then you already pled the blood, you already repented, you already have a clean slate, and there's nothing you can do, but you're still going through a rough valley. It's because of somebody else's sin. Remember, sin does not only affect that person. It affects others surrounding that person. You know what you need to do? Father, be merciful to that person. Forgive that person. You need to do that. 
Why? You don't want God to forgive that person? You don't want God to be merciful to that person? You want God to make sure that the person pays the price of sin where he not only gets infected, but you too? That's good. Fire you, I'd, uh, I'd say what Jesus said. Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. Be, shed mercy. That is God's mercy because sin has a price to pay. It is so horrendous. It requires judgment, which is why, think about it, why are we going through, why is this remnant going through a stressful time because of the wickedness of this whole city to begin with? If this whole city was right with God, this remnant wouldn't suffer as much as we go through. So you know what we need to do? We need to give them the gospel of Jesus Christ. We need to make sure their sins get forgiven. We need to plead God for mercy. God, will you be merciful? Yeah. Will you be merciful to us? Even if the person, God says, no, that person must go through judgment, then at least plead for mercy that, okay, Lord, um, then can you lighten it where it doesn't affect my life, where I'm trying to do something good for you? That's called mercy. God needs to be merciful to that other person because that person's sin is so great, it's affecting you. So you need to plead with the Lord for mercy and forgiveness where God can give some kind of leniency. If you don't believe in that, then fine, you know, have a nice day, okay? Just ask God for forgiveness over yourself and mercy over yourself, not the other person. What you're going to find out is that person's sin, that other person's sin has to affect you one day. The consequence of one person's sin is not just that person himself. It affects people around them. Surrounding them. Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sin. Famine, starvation, cry, all of this has to happen because of one man's sin. That's how horrible sin is. You know what Daniel, you know what the Old Testament prophets did? They weren't wicked. They weren't the ones that thought, but they said, forgive us. Forgive us, O oh Lord. We have sinned against you. Be merciful to us. You need to start praying like that. Maybe that's why you're in the rough valley. You need to realize that when you wash your hands and you're not the one at fault, you got to say, Lord, forgive us. Amen. Good. Wipe out the wickedness of all of us. The other person, my family, my friend, the city, my boss, co-workers, and the school that I'm at, you need to pray like that. Amen. Verse 9. Verse 9. So shalt thou put away the guilt of innocent blood from among you when thou shalt do that which is right in the sight of the Lord. My last point is worry in the rough valley. Worry in the rough valley. Notice that the, the people no longer have to worry because they've done that which is right in the sight of the Lord. They've done everything by the book, so they shouldn't worry anymore. People go through worse, rough valleys. And this is one of the worst things you can ever go through. When you go through work, rough valleys, there is that worried guilt that remains. Even if you're not the one at fault, even if you uh, crossed out uh, all the uh, crossed out all the issues in your life and you sacrificed on the altar, the devil always slips in a temptation and said, you could have done better. The devil will slip in a temptation and say, well, you know, there's that other certain part that you didn't get right with God with. The devil will always do stuff like that where you're going to have a clinging, worried guilt. And because of that, that's why you can never get peace and you're still stuck in a rough valley. It's amazing. Uh, you know, I, I'm pretty sure at the judgment seat of Christ that when God judges you, there's going to be a lot of things that you messed up in that you didn't know about. And then God says, you know, see, you messed up right here. You should have. And you go, oh, man, I didn't know about that. Oh, man, I got to repent here, right? I, 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 oh, why did, why, I was such a fool. I didn't see that. But you'd be surprised also at the judgment seat of Christ. There's going to be some things that, oh, God really messed up, and then all of a sudden you get more rewards than you thought. And God's going to go, what are you talking about? Stop being too hard on yourself. There's going to be those moments too. You need to find 
find those moments and you need to lay it on the altar. I'll tell you what can erase your worried guilt. That verse says, thou shalt do that which is right in the sight. When you're doing what's right. Here, let me give the worst case scenario, okay? You sin, you mess up, okay? And because of your sin, you're probably reaping what you've sown, okay? And then the sin is probably a habit that you can't let go. That is a horrible cycle because it always produces worry and guilt, right? What will free you from that is, isn't it right to repent or is it a sin to repent? It's right, right? It's, it's a no-brainer, right? It's not like a deep question. We can all agree with that, right? Isn't it right to get yourself back up? really uh, get right hard enough or no, 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 no. If you repent, you're doing what's right. If you get back up, you're doing what's right. Why not just focus on that and that will give you get peace when you come back to church and serve God. Amen. Well, when you keep thinking about I'm going to sin again and I'm going to sin again, I'm going to mess up again. See, obviously then you get worried guilt. But you don't get any worried guilt if you think about restoration. If you think about serving God, if you think about repentance, that God will forgive you if you confess it. That worry guilt is gone. Focus on what you're doing right, not what you're doing wrong. Yeah, you need to focus on what you're doing right. Amen. When you do that, you need to change that mentality. The mentality of that cycle that you're going through is not, I messed up again, I messed up again, I messed up again, but rather that I got myself back. I repented under the blood. It keeps you more at peace. Though. That's how you can get yourself out in a rough valley. You need to get out of that rough valley by focusing on the things you're doing right for the Lord, not on the things that you're doing wrong. When you keep looking at that cycle, you keep digging deeper into the rough valley. Let me tell you something, man. If you already surrendered it under the blood, God will help you. God will give you grace. God will pull you through, even through the hardships in life. And some moments where you might have to chastise you, but his chastisement is to make you more holy, not more simple, not stuck in a trap and cycle. You need to let go and let God, and then finally get out of that rough valley. Huh? Get out of that rough valley. There's a rough valley dead ahead of you. And a lot of you have been carrying that unconscious or conscious worry all the time. And you can't let it go. And that's eaten you up. It's about time that you let it go. You take that heifer on the altar, unyoked this time. And then say, God, here it is. Then what you need to do is wash your hands, go in peace. Every head bowed and every eye shut.